Namaste friends, welcome to another satsang on the Bhagavad Gita. The verse that we are going to be looking at today is verse 58 from chapter 2. I'm going to read the verse as I usually do before giving a brief commentary based on Swami's book, The Essence of the Bhagavad Gita. This is how the verse goes. Yada samharate chayam kurmo ganiva sarvashaha indriyani indriya arte bhyaha tasya pragna pratishtita and I will lead, read the literal translation of the verse as Swami Krinanda writes it. When a yogi, like a tortoise, withdrawing its heads and limbs into its shell, is able to withdraw his energy from objects of sense perception, he becomes established in wisdom. I'm going to read it again. When a yogi, like a tortoise withdrawing its head and its limbs into its shell, is able to withdraw his energy from, ob from the objects of sense perception, he becomes established in wisdom. I think it was either the previous uh, satsang on Gita or the one before, where I was sharing the power and the beauty of the images that scriptures like the Gita present for us. These images are so timeless and so powerful in how they visually communicate so much in just that brief uh, image. We were talking about the image of uh, a water droplet on a lotus leaf or like for example with this verse, a tortoise withdrawing its limbs into its shell. And I think it was the previous class where we were talking about the well and the water and flood. So all these powerful visual images communicate so much to us. And anytime we think of these spiritual principles as they apply in our lives, just imagining or thinking of this image uh, beautifully communicates the essence of the teaching for all of us. Even the image for that matter of God driving the chariot of the body and taking us where we need to be and guiding us every moment of our lives in, uh, on how we face that battle, how we move through this battlefield of life. All these images are so helpful for us. And this particular image is particularly appropriate and extremely powerful, I, at least I find so in my own life. Because if you think of a tortoise, uh, Krishna is talking about the limbs and the head. There are four limbs and one head for the tortoise. And if you know, if you've seen uh, a tortoise or a turtle do this in your life, whenever it's threatened or whenever it wants to draw itself inside, the tortoise just withdraws all of these into its shell and it just looks like, you know, it looks like the shell. It don't even, you don't even know whether there's any resident in there. <laughs> And so these five objects, the four limbs and the head, Krishna is equating it to the five senses that draw our energies outward. And he's telling Arjuna to establish yourself in wisdom. You want to draw all those inside. And, uh, you know, I've been sharing the teachings of meditation for many years now and any time I talk about them I always begin by introducing myself as a disciple of Yogananda and as a practitioner of this tradition of Kriya Yoga. And oftentimes, either in the class setting or after that in one-on-one -on -one when I'm with students, people would always ask me, you know, how is Kriya Yoga different from this particular meditation technique? How is uh, whatever you are teaching different from this other practice that I also do? You know, can you explain to me how do they coexist or are they different from each other? And I would give whatever answer was appropriate and depending upon whatever that technique, what this person was referring to. But in essence, the practice of Kriya, the practice of meditation, as Yoganandaji taught us, as Patanjali and the system of yoga teaches us, is this practice of drawing our senses in. And that is the primary definition. And sometimes, especially the word meditation in the English language is so generic. Um, I was just thinking about it today morning as I was meditating. What does that word even mean? I didn't get a chance to look at the dictionary, but you know, we all know it could mean so many things. I'm going to meditate on this idea of going on this trip. I'm going to meditate on this or that. Essentially, it could mean so many things. It could simply mean 
thinking about something, it could mean really going still, drawing our energy into our center. Based on the context and connotation, it can have a whole lot of different shades of what it means. And even in the Eastern system, we use the Sanskrit word dhyana, and it's a very appropriate word. It means concentration, absorption. But again, I think of that word, it talks about the what of meditation, but it does not necessarily talk about the how. So even that word is not all that helpful uh, when we want to practice and go toward that state of complete absorption on that object of concentration. And in this verse, Krishna is actually presenting to us the key because the key is drawing that energy away from the senses. In fact, uh, in the autobiography of a yogi, when Yogananda describes the technique of Kriya Yoga and he talks about meditation, he uses the word scientific and unscientific in a very interesting way. He talks about how Kriya Yoga is a scientific technique of meditation and oftentimes without a technique such as Kriya, it could be any other technique with which you work with your own energies, with which you consciously draw these senses in, but without such a scientific technique, he says, people use unscientific methods of introspection and contemplation in order to reach this goal. In in order to actually be able to reach that goal of complete absorption and it is not as effective. Because why is this technique uh, unscientific? Why is simple, simple introspection or contemplating on a subject or a topic, even contemplation on God, why is it not as effective as working with our energies, working with our life force? That's essentially what Krishna is talking about and I'll come to that in a bit. It's because as much as we affirm that state, as much as we are trying to be in that state of absorption, what's working against us is not the power of thought. What's working against us is the life force, is that prana that is being constantly drawn out through the senses. So unless we can use some sort of a scientific method to turn that energy back in, to be able to draw that back into our spine, we cannot be effective in that practice of meditation. We don't quite know how to get to that goal. And talking of the life force, that essentially is what all of this comes down to. And Kriya is obviously one of the most effective ways. And it's the path and the meditation technique that Yoganandaji taught us in order to practice it, practice this, uh, you know, meditation and reaching this ultimate goal of union. But in essence, we are working with it throughout our own life. During all of life situations, our energy is constantly being drawn out. And this particular uh, uh, teaching, this uh, point that Krishna is making even gets subtler because it is not just about the senses themselves. That's why, in fact, Krishna is making a uh, distinction, if you notice in the verse. He's talking about the energy drawn out through the sense objects. He's not talking about just, um, you know, in meditation, obviously, we try as much as we can to shut our senses down. We close our eyes. Um, we, do, we are not playing any music or sounds unless you're going through a visualization or something like that. We are sitting still, we are not moving our body, we are shutting down our motor nerves as well. So we are doing our best to shut down our nerves, but even as much as we try, you cannot really eradicate those senses. You cannot necessarily completely diminish them to nothing. Because even with closed eyes, if somebody were to switch on or off the lights in the room, you would still be aware. And as much as you might wear meditation headphones to avoid sound, the headphones that I use are rated at 35 decibels. And I've realized that that is the most you can buy easily, that can be worn comfortably, and I can wear it for about half an hour. But after half an hour, I'm not as comfortable, I have to remove them. And even with those, you know, really, really heavy headphones that I wear during my meditation practice, if somebody were to make a loud noise, I would still hear them which means the senses are always active. It is not that we are trying to completely diminish the function of these senses, but we are drawing energy away from them. We are drawing energy away from the sense objects. <clears throat> these are objects not just of perception, but even that object that draws that energy out, we are trying to turn that energy inward and draw it back into our spine. In a recent webinar on a different topic that I was sharing, 
I was describing this beautiful image that Yoganandaji Ji often used. Uh, he started teaching in the year 1920, that's when he came to the US and you know it was a very different time and he would often use this image of sense telephones and <laughs> telephones were you know a rather a hot technology at that time uh, and now you know for somebody who's eight or nine years old I have to explain what a telephone is they have no idea if you were to show a telephone I happen to have grown up at a time where I did speak on telephones I clearly knew what they were but you know kids these days wouldn't have any idea because all they know is their iPhone or, or some smart gadget that they carry in their pockets but I'm going to assume most of you are watching this perhaps are aware of what a telephone is now a telephone is just sitting there. This is what I was sharing. It's just sitting right there and it's connected to whatever telephone line that it's connected to, but it's always in a state of receptivity. And that's the energy that we are talking about that's invested in sense objects. Now it might not be doing anything, just like when we are sitting in meditation, our senses are not actively engaged. But if somebody were to call your telephone, it will immediately ring because it's always receiving. It's always connected to that telephone line and it's always re receiving that signal. So any distraction could immediately reach it at any point. And that's what we are trying to turn away from. We are trying to unplug that telephone, not just ask people not to call us. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's how I think of it, you know, trying to sit in meditation and uh, trying to shut ourselves uh, off from any external stimuli is just asking all our friends, please don't call me. But still, that is not the most effective way because we have to unplug that telephone because that, that energy is committed to always being receptive. Now, as I was starting to say, this gets subtler than that because this is not just about that sense object. What's drawing that energy out is actually what's propelling that energy, that prana that is flowing in the inner spine is not necessarily the objects of the outer world. That's the fascinating aspect of the science of yoga. What's propelling it out are currents in our own spine. These two currents called Ida and Pingala. I made brief reference to this subject in an earlier webinar, I don't remember which Gita verse I was talking about, but later on when we talk of the fourth chapter, when we reach uh, the verses where we explicitly discuss the teachings of Kriya Yoga, I plan to go into greater detail talking about these subtle energy channels in our own body, but in essence, these, um, these distractions, this uh, drawing of energy outside of our spine from our own uh, center, this leakage of vital life force starts from within because all these impressions that we hold in our astral spine, what we hold in our chakras, these vrittis, that's how Patanjali calls them, all these impressions of past habits, of all the things that we bring into this moment, both before and after birth, that's how Yoganandaji called it all the longings, regrets, desires, you know, cravings, everything that holds us back from living in that pure experience of bliss, that is always pushing that energy out. It's keeping those two nerve channels of Ida and Pingala always separate from being united from that central nerve channel of Sushumna. So Swami Kriyananda launches into this huge commentary on this verse talking about Ida and Pingala and Sushumna because that's where the root of the problem lies. That's what is reflected in our physical breath and through the practice of meditation we are gradually trying to go toward that state of complete breathlessness but the way we do it is by neutralizing those currents in the uh, two channels Ida and Pingala because when that prana go, comes into our body, when that starts flowing in our spine, all these vrittis in the chakra are constantly pulling Ida and Pingala on either side and they're drawing that energy out and that energy has to leak through the objects of senses. That's really what's happening, that's the reality that we live in. Again, Swami Kriyananda talks about the moment of birth when a baby comes into this world, when the baby draws its first breath, he says those, that 
those energy channels, Ida and Pingala, immediately come into action and immediately there's this flow of energy and the baby starts drawing its breath in and he says immediately it reaches out through the senses. And that is why that moment when the baby draws its first breath is a cosmic moment, at least for that one incarnation. It determines so much, it's going to determine the trajectory of how that one lifetime is about to flow, how it's about to unfold. That's why astrologers use that as a critical moment for plotting the horoscope of that one incarnation. What's happening at that moment is that those two energy channels are set into motion. And when they are set into motion, when that individual expression of that incarnation completely descends onto this material plane, immediately the physical breath flows in. And immediately at that very moment, that energy is drawn out. That energy is drawn out through the sense objects. And the practice of meditation, again as Yoganandaji puts it, is using scientific methods to gradually draw that energy in, to be able to turn those sense telephones off, to turn those five senses inward, because that energy is not lost, that energy is not being diminished. It has to be brought back into that inner spine, into that astral spine, the deep spine of Sushumna where it can be directed toward this point of intuition, toward surrender into the divine light. <clears throat> there is a further subtlety to this teaching. It's both subtle and also extremely practical, so it's almost ironical. Because the subtle energy of Ida and Pingala is something that's always happening and drawing us out, but the way we experience it in our own daily life is through the reactive process. And that again becomes this important concept in the practice of meditation. In fact, as Swami Kriyananda writes in one of his other books, the reactive process is the way we measure the effectiveness of our own meditation practice. Because the more we are able to meditate in these scientific ways, the more we are able to truly draw that energy in, the first effect or the effect that we'll continue to observe in our own life is that we become both consciously aware and capable of choosing and controlling the way we react to things of this world. Because that reaction that we have is that first impulse, is that effect of that energy, that vritti in the chakra, that ida and pingala being drawn out and then us being uh, pushed away from our own inner spine through those sense objects. Whatever it is, when you're driving in traffic, somebody cuts you with their car and then you're immediately upset. Somebody does not, somebody at work, you know, says something unkind. Somehow you feel you're not recognized for something you did. And that first impulse of being upset, being frustrated, being angry, being sad, being depressed, that is a reactive process that is constantly disturbing our inner state of calmness. And meditation is the practice of reclaiming that. And how do we reclaim that? We want to overcome that reactive process. We want to control that reactive process. Again, this is where the distinction between scientific and unscientific really becomes important because by simply introspecting or contemplating on it, we can only observe the fruits, we can observe the effects of what it's doing to us, even if we were completely self-honest, let alone the fact that the introspection is a faculty of the mind and often Sometimes it is heavily tainted by our own ego and our predilections. But I'm not going to get into that. Even let's just say we are completely self-honest and we are able to have an objective view of who we are and we are able to look at this reactive process as a third person to observe and know its effects. Even then, we do not have the faculties to neutralize it. The faculty to neutralize it comes from working with our energy. It comes from working with our own life force. That is why in the battlefield of Mahabharata, the five warriors who are fighting on the positive side, who are fighting towards liberation, are the five Pandava brothers who are symbols for the five chakras. Because what are we working with? We are not working with the mind. We are working with the vital life force. We are working with that life force to draw it away from those sense objects. And by doing so, we are drawing Ida and Pingala closer and closer to that deeper spine. And by doing so, we are controlling and neutralizing our own reactive process. 
Now, before I finish, I want to share a brief exercise that Swami shares in this particular the commentary for this verse. I have to say honestly, I had not paid attention. It almost seems like I've never read this before. And I was so thrilled when I read this particular part of commentary for this per verse because Swami, as often he does in this book, gives us a lot of practical ways of how we work with ourselves, how we apply these teachings, these lofty teachings of Gita in our daily life. So this is what he writes. Beginning yogis, should try to become conscious of the connection between their reactive emotions, both positive and negative, and the corresponding upward and downward flow of energy in the Ida and Pingala. This practice of centeredness in the spine will minimize their preoccupation with whatever occurs outwardly in their lives and with what has already occurred in the past. This practice will focus their attention on the simple movement of energy in the spine. Now, <laughs> I love how he starts this paragraph by saying, beginning yogis. So in case you were wondering if this was a practice that was applicable or not for you, he's making it very clear. This is truly applicable for all of us. And what he's describing is very, very simple. Always observe, keep your awareness at the center in your own spine as we move through life situation, as we experience different emotions, feel that as a flow of energy in your own spine because this process of neutralizing starts first with awareness. Even in the path of Kriya Yoga, we always start with the simplest of meditation techniques where we do nothing but observe the breath. And Yoganandaji said the Hongsa technique, which is a technique of observing the breath, is as powerful that if you did it for hours, it is, it is capable of taking you to that highest state of Samadhi. So this exercise that Swami Kriyananda is describing is always paying attention, always being aware of that flow of energy in our spine. And how do we do that? Pay close attention to that inner feeling whenever you have a moment of excitement, whenever you hear something unpleasant, whenever you're planning something and the plan just falls apart. Immediately notice, what do I feel in my spine? Am I aware of that downward flow in my own astral spine? Do I feel my ida and pingala? And if you notice, it is not really all that hard to feel. In fact, if you watch kids, this is again the clearest of examples that we can find in our own lives. Think of a two or three year old in a supermarket. I have had a couple of experiences, especially in this country, of watching kids throwing tantrums in supermarkets. <laughs> it is not a very uncommon scene. You know, when they want something, when they get it, you just see in the ice cream aisle, in the candy aisle, they feel like their spirit has to leave the body right in that moment because they got their sense object of satisfaction because that energy is rising up the spine and they literally jump up <laughs> because it feels like that energy is going to propel them up in the air. And at the same time, <laughs> if the parent has to deny that request, if that is not granted, you can f see them just fall to the ground, sobbing, crying, yelling, and just having a complete tantrum because that energy, the weight of that energy is pulling them down. Now in a child which does not have as many mental preoccupations or conditionings as an adult, this energy is so clearly visible with something as simple as a candy bar. Whereas it's not all the different, it just becomes all the more complex in an adult world. It's still, we have our own candy bars that we either get or don't get in our daily life. And every time we have one of those experiences of either having or not having what we desire, there is that flow of Ida and Pingala. It's not necessarily happening in that deep Sushumna because it is still a response to the outside world. But as you become more and more aware of these responses as flows of energy in our spine, we gradually become capable of directing that life force, of drawing it away from the sense object and offering it up at the spiritual eye, at the feet of divine, surrendering all these reactive processes because that is ultimately the way we are liberated. Through this process of meditation, we direct the life force, we draw it in. And the final goal of all of this is to offer it up and dissolve it at the light at this point at the spiritual eye. So until we meet next week with a different Gita verse, God bless you.